Good afternoon, and welcome to our Come and Listen lecture on telling some Jewish stories in Monticello with Olivia Brown. So happy you're here this afternoon. My name is John Ragosta. I'm a historian at the International Center for Jefferson Studies, and we are especially excited about the discussion today because Olivia is the first in a new group. We've had guides before as fellows at ICGS, but we've restarted this program, and Olivia was our first person, and next week, You'll be able to hear from Andrew Miles, who is currently on his fellowship at ICGS. But let me begin by introducing Olivia. Olivia is a full-time tour guide and a part-time supervisor in the house. She's been with us for about four years. She received her BA in History and American Studies from the University of Virginia in 2015, a master's degree in public history with a certificate in museum management from the University of South Carolina. Uh, she has focused for 10 years on interpretation, education, and community programming. Today's topic was not only her the topic of her fellowship, but uh, an issue she's very interested in. Her work in graduate school was about the American South and the age of uh, great immigration in the early 20th century, and particularly focusing on the Jewish community. She has worked closely with the Columbia Jewish Heritage Initiative. And of course, this is an issue particularly important in Monticello with the Loveys of Monticello. Um, so, Olivia, we're very happy to have you. I was told to be very careful to remind everyone, if you have not silenced your cell phones, please do so. And if you are from EVP, uh, please make sure you sign up for credit today. But, Olivia. Thank you so much, John. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here, both in person and online. My name is Olivia Brown. Uh, as John said, I am a guide here at Monticello and completed my historic research, uh, historic interpretation research fellowship this November at uh, ICJS, the International Center for Jefferson Studies. I spent the whole month researching more about Jewish ties to Monticello uh, and especially looked at how these Jewish stories were tied also to stories of enslavement here. Uh, so today I'll be sharing with you some of the things that I learned, but as you can see just by the PowerPoint, I'm only going to be able to tell some of the many stories that I was able to find during that fellowship. Uh, but before I get begin, I do want to just take one moment to thank uh, a few people for their help on this project. Uh, the entire ICJS staff was incredible during my month uh, over there. Uh, not only did they help me with things like the microfilm machine, uh, but also pulling materials and providing me with much needed human interaction because you can take the guide out of the house, uh, but sitting quietly is not something I do particularly well. So they uh, allowed me the opportunity to talk to people. Um, I'd also like to thank our colleagues in the Getting Word Project for the work that they did. So thank you all uh, to everyone who's helped to support this project uh, as I worked on it and hopefully continue in the future. All right, on to the real stuff. Uh, we need a little background. So often when people think of Jewish history here at Monticello, either they think of nothing at all uh, or maybe the Levy family. Uh, now, there is a very rich Jewish history in our country, and it dates back hundreds of years. So I'm going to start first with just a little bit of context. Now, the first Jewish person to arrive in what is now the United States was likely Joachim Gantz in 1585. He was a miner from Prague who was hired as part of the expedition of Sir Walter Raleigh. The first place, though, to have an actual Jewish community uh, was New Amsterdam in 1654, what we know as New York. Now, for about 30 years, the Jews of New Amsterdam were barred from even having a communal religious space of their own. Uh, they faced restrictive laws on where they could live, even how far out of the city they were allowed to trade, if at all. Um, so there were significant uh, obstacles that they had. Now, as you can see kind of on the timeline on the screen here, uh, there were other Jewish communities in this early period of European colonization. In British North America, Jews created spaces for themselves in Newport, Rhode Island uh, in 1658, Savannah, Georgia in 1733, and in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Charleston, South Carolina in the 1740s. The earliest Jews to arrive in Albemarle County are believed to be Michael and Sarah Israel in 1757. Uh, they are for whom Israel's Mountain and Israel's Gap are named. They purchased land around North Garden, uh, but were not living in what we, were con we would consider Charlottesville at that time. When we think about Charlottesville itself, 
really think more about the early 19th century and this kind of lifetime uh, or later adult lifetime of Thomas Jefferson. We'll talk more in depth about some of the people that you see uh, listed here. But in Charlottesville, some of the earliest recorded Jewish people were merchants like David Isaacs and Isaac Raphael, uh, a lawyer named Nathaniel Wolf, and others like D.H. Stern and A.B. Heller. While there were clearly Jewish people living in the city during Thomas Jefferson's lifetime, they did not have a house of worship here in Charlottesville. The local synagogue congregation Beth Israel wasn't founded until 1881. For the people named here, if they wanted a formal place to practice their Jewish faith, they would have had to travel all the way to Richmond, where the synagogue Kahal Kadosh Beth Shalom uh, had been established already. In 1700, there were approximately 200 Jews living in British North America, compared to a total population of about 250,000. That makes about 0.08% of the total population. Uh, that number grew a little, and by the time of the American Revolution, there were approximately 2,500 Jews living in that same region. Around 1769, a German Jewish immigrant named Isaiah Isaacs became the first Jewish person to settle in Richmond, Virginia. He and his business partner, Jacob I. Cohen, eventually helped to found that first synagogue, Kahal Kadosh Beth Shalom, in 1789. Eventually, Isaiah Isaac's brother, David Isaacs, who I'll talk a lot more about, uh, was also born in Germany but came to Virginia as well, uh, though not quite sure the exact year that he's going to immigrate uh, to the state. Uh, I will talk a lot more about David Isaacs in a little while. Now, during the American Revolutionary War, there was a Jewish presence in the Continental Army. Uh, to give an idea, for those of you who may be familiar with some of the history of the Levy family, uh, Uriah Levy's grandfather, Jonas Phillips, his father, Michael Levy, and his uncle, Manuel Noah, were all Revolutionary War veterans. Now, to round out this bit of background, I'll just mention uh, the one other statistic that you uh, see up on the screen here. By 1790, there were approximately 200 Jews living in the state of Virginia, and at that time, Richmond was very much the largest of those communi communities. Now, this kind of brings me to one of the main research questions I was asking myself uh, throughout my time doing this fellowship. As we consider how Jewish history may be tied to Monticello, uh, we maybe ask ourselves this. How did a Jewish man from New York come to enslave people in Charlottesville? But a Jewish man from Virginia instead married into the free black community. Now, it might seem like I haven't really set us up to get to the answer to this question, uh, but as many of you, especially here in this room, know, we can answer almost every single question at Monticello with two words. It's complicated. Uh, my intent with this research uh, that I wanted to do during the fellowship was to understand how two Jewish men found their lives tied to Monticello uh, through business, through purchase, but also through these ties of both kinship and bondage. The two men I started with were David Isaacs and Uriah Levy, but their stories brought me to a lot more people along the way. Now, when it does come to uh, Jewish involvement in slavery in the South, I looked a little bit into this topic specifically. What's important to understand about this, however, is that Jews were coming from places, especially in Europe, where they were outsiders and were significantly discriminated against. They were often the subjects of violence due to their status as an other in their societies. Over time, in the colonies of North and South America and in the Caribbean, the goal by Jewish colonists was to assimilate and to blend in. This led uh, to Jewish people in these colonies and eventually in the United States operating quite similarly to their white, non-Jewish counterparts. So Jews did enslave people. Jews bought and sold people. But they were not typically the largest slaveholders, nor were they historically planters or farmers. In Europe, they had been restricted to certain occupations, which led them to urban centers uh, and jobs that were not primarily agricultural. This continued after they immigrated. According to the 1820 federal census, the average Jewish household in the United States enslaved three people. Uh, they likely were serving as domestic laborers. When it came to the slave trade itself, there were indeed Jewish traders, 
that the sizes of these firms that were negligible compared to those that were owned by non-Jewish people. There was a Jewish family in the Petersburg and Richmond area, the Davises, who were slave traders. On this slide, you actually can see over here on the right, this is, uh, I know it's a little hard to see because it's from a microfilm from a city directory from the 1850s. So that's why uh, after that many scans get a little bit difficult. What it shows is an advertisement taken out in the Richmond City Directory by Benjamin Davis. Uh, and it shows that the Jewish Davis family actually operated an auction and commission house specializing, uh, let's see if I can get this to work clearly, right, in the uh, sale of enslaved people. Now, on the other side of the argument, Jews were absolutely also part of the abolitionist movement. They spent time working for anti-slavery causes and advocating for the emancipation of enslaved people, too. So Jews were both fighting for and against the institution of slavery. Thinking about telling Jewish stories at Monticello, first we come to the man himself, Thomas Jefferson, right? Now, if people are thinking at all about Jefferson and Judaism, it's perhaps minimal, though I can confirm I have been asked about it on tour before. Uh, and when we think about Jefferson and Judaism, you probably are not going to think about something like this. An article in the New York Times in 2007 claimed that Jefferson could have had a way back Jewish ancestor based on some of his DNA. Now, arguing that this makes Jefferson maybe our first Jewish president, I think is a little bit of a stretch, to say the least. Um, but if we're thinking about Jefferson and Judaism, more than likely, we're thinking about this. Right, in 1777, Thomas Jefferson drafted the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom. This is something he considered to be one of his greatest achievements, and it's a document with a long-lasting legacy, including influencing the First Amendment and federal protection for freedom of religion in the United States. Jefferson was a proponent of the separation of church and state, and ultimately believed that a person's religious belief was between that person and their own God and nobody else. The belief extended also to people from religions all over the world. In his uh, partially completed autobiography, Jefferson wrote that, quote, within the mantle of the statute's protection were the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and the Mahometan, the Hindu and infidel of every denomination. All these people and others could be protected in the United States and should be able to practice freely. Now, throughout Jefferson's own lifetime, he had a number of Jewish correspondents. Man writes a lot of letters, and some of them he sends to Jewish people. Some of them he spoke to about Judaism itself. Uh, some of them he spoke to about completely different business. So I'm going to highlight a few of the people uh, Jefferson is writing letters to or from that he's getting letters from. Uh, some others that you can see here, people like Moses Myers was a banker in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, Abraham Cohen was a scientist who wrote to Jefferson about the scientific benefits of mineral water, which I can only assume Jefferson was extremely excited about because it seems like something he would like. Uh, but there were others as well that Jefferson is writing to. David Salisbury Franks was a former aide-de-camp of Benedict Arnold and wrote to Jefferson while serving as vice consul to Marseille. He had a long political career, obviously was also involved in the American Revolutionary War, uh, and was one of the highest ranking Jewish public officials of this time. Frank's here, you see on the right in his portrait, but there's also a, a historic marker in Philadelphia that is dedicated to him as well. Now, I don't think based on my research uh, that Jefferson ever actually exchanged letters with this man, uh, but he's an interesting one to think about. Dr. John de Sequera, uh, was a prominent physician in Williamsburg and also served as personal physician to Martha Park Custis, George Washington's stepdaughter. Jefferson wrote about him, though not because of his medical practice, uh, but rather credits him with the introduction of the tomato as an edible plant. Thomas Jefferson, always keen on understanding as much as he could about botany and horticulture, shocked everyone in the city of Lynchburg when he plucked a tomato from someone's garden and took a bite out of it. They wrote about it in the newspaper. Um, it was in front of a crowd. People were very shocked. Now, Jefferson said that it was actually de Sequera who was the one who introduced the tomato as edible rather than poisonous. To note, though, in Williamsburg, John de Sequera was required, even as a Jewish person, to pay tithes to the Anglican church. Uh, and while in Williamsburg, he enslaved two people. Now, throughout the talk, you'll kind of see this pattern emerge of Jewish people who are enslaving somewhere between one and five people 
And as I said, I think that those were mostly domestic laborers that are working in their homes. Mordecai Manuel Noah was a journalist and a diplomat. He was appointed in 1813 by James Madison as the consul to Tunis. But then he was recalled by Secretary of State James Monroe. Monroe said, and you can see uh, the quote here, quote, it was not known that the religion you profess would form any obstacle to the exercise of your consular functions. Now, we don't actually know exactly what it is that caused Monroe to recall Noah, uh, but clearly he stated somehow that it was related to Noah's Judaism. Now, Noah was a cousin of Uriah Levy, which showed me also an interesting connection because I don't think we have any evidence that Thomas Jefferson and Uriah Levy ever met or corresponded, but Jefferson is writing and corresponding letters with one of Uriah Levy's extent extended family members. So Noah actually then later gave a speech at the reconsecration of the New York synagogue Shearth Israel, and he sent his remarks not only to Thomas Jefferson, but also to John Adams and to James Madison. In writing back to Noah, Jefferson acknowledged what many already knew to be true. The Jews had been systematically persecuted throughout history because of their religious affiliations. He hoped that the laws of the United States would help to alleviate that persecution. But then he secondly acknowledged that there was more to be done because public opinion did not always match the laws that were in place. I took this as Jefferson's understanding, at least somewhat, of anti-Semitism in the country and that Jewish people were still being treated in a way unequal to their non-Jewish counterparts. Uh, one year after that, in 1820, Thomas Jefferson wrote to a man named Dr. Jacob de la Mata. He was from Charleston, but then was working in Savannah, Georgia. And he similarly sent his remarks to Jefferson on Judaism. Jefferson, many years later, uh, even after writing that statute, still held to this belief of religious freedom, and he wrote to De La Mata that he hoped Jews would be able to, quote, take their seats on the benches of science as preparatory to doing their same at the board of government. Jefferson's hope was that Jews could be a part of the government of the United States, but it wouldn't be another 25 years after he wrote this letter that a Jewish person would be elected as a congressman or a senator. One of De La Mata's contemporaries in Charleston and then uh, later in Georgia as well uh, was Isaac Harvey. And Harvey came from a slaveholding family. He later is very much a pro-Jackson campaigner. And he, uh, the estimates from the time say that of the 109 Jewish families living in Charleston, 92 of them enslaved people. According to the 1810 census, Harvey enslaved seven people. And he was a journalist, mostly known, though, for being an advocate uh, though an advocate for reforming Jewish laws and principles. Uh, this later led to the Reform Judaism movement, and in 1827, Isaac Harvey served as the president uh, of the Reform Society of Israelites Promoting True Principles of Judaism According to Its Purity and Spirit. That is the full name of that organization. I'm only going to say it one time for everybody's sake. Now, before serving in that leadership role, Isaac Harvey wrote to Jefferson about his idea for proposed reforms to the Jewish religion. Jefferson told Harvey uh, that he thought reforms to everything were necessary as the human mind improved and expanded. He also spoke briefly about the University of Virginia, saying that imposed theological reading would not be compulsory to the curriculum. Now, one thing that I actually like about this letter is the first line. Jefferson says, quote, I am little acquainted with the liturgy of the Jews or their mode of worship. And this is something that became clear in uh, some of Jefferson's other writings. He was also always actively trying to understand the actual religious aspects of the Jewish faith, uh, but overall also understood that his understanding of Judaism was pretty rudimentary. Now, while Jefferson was corresponding with Jews from other states, he's also corresponding with Jewish people here in Virginia. Um, he's writing letters and doing business with Jews in Virginia. Uh, one of the most affluent Jews in Richmond was Joseph Marks. He eventually was the director of the Richmond Bank of the uh, Richmond branch of the Second Bank of the United States. And he and Jefferson wrote a series of letters back and forth to each other from 1817 through 1820. Now, Marx wrote to Jefferson about what was called the Paris Sanhedrin. Uh, this was essentially a Jewish governing board that was established by Napoleon Bonaparte. 
It had been created in 1806, uh, and laws in France then went back and forth. So Napoleon created the Sanhedrin, uh, but then there were more restrictive laws against Jews, and Napoleon abolished those, uh, only to go back and reinstitute them again. Uh, Marx sent some of the information about the Sanhedrin to Jefferson, who wrote a letter back to him, saying that he regretted, quote, seeing a sect, the parent and basis of all those of Christendom, singled out by all of them for a persecution and oppression, which prove they have profited nothing from the benevolent doctrines of him whom they profess to make the model of their principles and practice. Now, Jefferson may be writing a lot of letters, but he is also doing business with Jewish people here in Charlottesville. Now, there weren't many, uh, but the memorandum books indicate that he's at the very least doing business with Isaac Raphael, Joel Wolfe, and David Isaacs. Now, Raphael and Isaacs were both merchants who owned dry goods stores. Uh, Joel Wolfe, Raphael's brother-in-law, eventually owned the store and business with him, and then his other brother-in-law, Nathaniel Wolfe, was a lawyer. From the firm of Wolfe and Raphael, Jefferson bought cheese, tea, and sugar. He also wrote in the letter that you see here on the right uh, that he said Raphael, quote, holds his little bank here. So it seems by looking actually at the memorandum books that Jefferson was holding credit lines with Raphael and borrowing small sums of money from him. And then the combined business of Wolf and Raphael uh, to then pay off other credits as well, in addition to purchasing things like goods and foodstuff from them. Now, from David Isaacs, Jefferson bought a number of things including foodstuffs like cheese and beef, uh, but also a horse named Tecumseh and a ball of twine that was used to map out the first pavilion at UVA's Academical Village. Isaacs also sent Jefferson a copy of a pamphlet about Judaism called Elements of the Jewish Faith, and in a letter to Isaacs, Jefferson thanked him for sending that along. Now, you can also see here, see if I can get this to work down in the bottom, this is uh, an image that is the last recorded uh, purchase in Jefferson's memorandum books. And the last thing that Jefferson records in late June 1826 before he dies was a purchase for cheese from David Isaacs. Now, in 1822 and 1823, Jefferson was borrowing regularly from Isaac Raphael. All the highlighted parts here are times that Jefferson is talking about taking out these credits um, you can just see based on these few scans that he had multiple instances. He said that he was either, quote, drawing on or giving order on Raphael for money or for credit. Now, according to the 1820 federal census, Isaac Raphael uh, enslaved three people here in Charlottesville. All three were women, one under the age of 14 and two others between ages 26 and 44. Backing up this previous idea that I mentioned that most Jewish enslavers owned a small number of people who were likely domestic laborers working in their homes or perhaps their stores. That's probably the case here. It's also possible that one of the women in that 26 to 44 age bracket uh, may have been the mother of a younger woman who was the one who was uh, under the age of 14, though I'm not sure what their names were. Now, other Charlottesville Jews were doing similar things. Uh, though a little bit later, a man named Jacob Bachrock was a Jewish merchant, and in 1860, he was recorded in the census enslaving two people in his household, two women. Nathaniel Wolfe, after his family and the Raphaels moved to Louisville, Kentucky, enslaved three people, two women and one man, and had an Irish domestic servant working in his home as well. So these patterns continue to be reflected through the census data. Now, this brings us to the Isaacs family. The Isaacs are one of the two main Jewish families that I did research on through this fellowship. Uh, just a quick show of hands, maybe for those of you in this room, people online, welcome to chime in as well. Anyone familiar with the story of David Isaacs and Nancy West? All right, at least a few of you here uh, in this space. Now, if you don't know the names David Isaacs or Nancy West, uh, you may recognize the names of some of their relatives, and we'll get to that in a little while. I knew about them a bit before I started doing this work. Their story was one that fascinated me from the time that I heard it. Uh, David Isaacs was a German Jewish immigrant who made his way to Charlottesville by 1793, following his older brother Isaiah, who had moved here the year before from Richmond. 
He was named one of the executors of the will of Thomas West, and through that, he met West's daughter, Nancy. And Nancy West, sometimes referred to in the records as Anne, was born to a white father, Thomas West, and a formerly enslaved mother named Priscilla. She was born, uh, Nancy West, was born a free woman of color uh, and lived most of her adult life in a common law marriage to David Isaacs. Isaacs and West had seven children, but were never able to legally marry due to the laws prohibiting interracial marriage. And doubly, they were not able to be married in the Jewish faith because Nancy was not Jewish. And because Nancy West was not Jewish, their children were also not considered Jewish, nor were they raised in the Jewish faith or by any indication raised with Jewish identities. They spent, uh, David Isaacs and Nancy West spent years in and out of court defending their relationship. Uh, and if you're interested in reading any more about that, uh, I highly recommend the work of Joshua Rothman called Notorious in the Neighborhood. It details a lot about uh, the court proceedings that Isaacs and West went through. Now, Isaacs and West are among only five known instances in which the documentary evidence indicates the cohabitation of Jewish people and free black people. They were also the only of the five who were never or who were ever brought to court over that fact. Now, shown actually here on the side is part of David Isaacs's will. Uh, it's housed here in Charlottesville at the courthouse. He willed lots of land, uh, furniture, and his home to Nancy West. And he also formally acknowledged her in his will as the mother of their seven children. He also gave money to a woman named Penelope, who I think is Nancy West's sister, uh, Penelope's son, and someone he called in his will Old Siller, which I believe is uh, Nancy West's mother, Priscilla. Now, uh, one quick note just for ease of uh, the whole thing is I'm going to refer to them as husband and wife. Obviously, I've already told you that they were not legally able to be husband and wife, uh, but it gets confusing if I have to say common law husband and common law wife every time. Um, so I will refer to them in that way. Now, in 1837, the same year that her husband died, Nancy West was required to file for a deed of manumission. Uh, and that's what actually is in the image here. Notice that she files under the name Nancy Isaacs. Um, she was born free, but didn't have legal papers until she was 56 years old, proving it due to the laws in Virginia that were quickly getting more restrictive at this time for both free and enslaved people of color. Nancy West, in her own right, uh, was a force to be reckoned with here in Charlottesville. She owned significant property and was considered the wealthiest non-white person in Charlottesville, with approximately $7,000 in estimated property value by 1850. She signed her will and other documents with her mark, uh, which indicates to me the strong possibility that she was illiterate. And she still did all of these things, which I think is pretty amazing. She was a baker. She had her own shop uh, and owned multiple lots of land on Main Street in Charlottesville, separate from the lots of land that were later deeded to her by David Isaacs after his death in 1837. Now, in 1850, the year she eventually left Charlottesville, an article in the Stanton Republican Vindicator uh, wrote about free people of color who were being forced to leave the state. The article said of Nancy West, quote, This old woman is in her 70th year, is the owner of some of the most valuable property in this town. She was born and raised here, and with the exception of the time she was out of the Commonwealth, a little upwards of a year, has always resided in Charlottesville. It may seem hard to enforce the law in her case, but as there are others who are not as wealthy against whom the law will be enforced, it is probable that she cannot escape its penalty. She had seven children, three daughters, and four sons, all of whom went by the last name Isaacs. They were Jane, Thomas, Hayes, Tucker, Frederick, Julia Ann, and Agnes. The Isaacs West family is not only tied to Monticello through the business that David Isaacs did with Thomas Jefferson, but also through the marriage of two of their children into the families that were enslaved here at Monticello. Two of the children of David Isaacs and Nancy West married into the Hemings family. Tucker Isaacs married Anne Elizabeth Fawcett, the daughter of Joseph and Edith Fawcett and great-granddaughter of Elizabeth Hemings. Julia Ann Isaacs married Eston Hemings, the son of, Th of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Now, Joseph Fawcett, and uh, Anne Elizabeth's father and Eston Hemings received their freedom following Thomas Jefferson's death. 
They lived in Charlottesville in close proximity to the Isaacs West family. Now, this map here is one of the earliest plans of the city of Charlottesville, and it kind of vaguely, it's very light, but you can see that it has the lots denoted with numbers on them. And so this is essentially what we know today as the downtown mall. Uh, looking simply at how many lots are owned by members of this family, what I've circled here in red, uh, you can see that they had significant property. Joseph Fawcett had a uh, blacksmith shop at lot 30, I believe also perhaps a home there. Uh, David Isaacs owned lots uh, 37 and 38 here, uh, and he also likely had a home there, which he will later give to his wife, Nancy. Nancy West owned three lots and later gave one to her daughter and son-in-law as a place to live. Uh, and Hayes Isaacs, one of their sons, will owned uh, lot 19, which is up here. Now, at various times, Eston Hemmings owned multiple lots too, including parts of lot 35 uh, that he bought and sold from the Isaacs West family. Now, if we put a modern map on top of the map that I just showed you, you'll see what's on these spots. So I hope some of you may consider this map uh, the next time you go downtown. Next time you eat in restaurants like the Melting Pot or Citizen Burger or Bizu or Jack Brown's, those are on lots that were previously owned by these families. Banks and pharmacies, concert venues, toy stores, and bookshop sit on lots that were owned by these families. Now, one lot in particular was interesting because it changed hands a number of times, but among the same family. Nancy West owned lot 35, and in 1844, she sold the lot to Eston Hemmings, her son-in-law. Hemmings no longer lived in Charlottesville, as he and his wife at that point had already moved to Chillicothe, Ohio, but he apparently still owned property in the city. One year later, he sold part of that land to his brother-in-law, Tucker Isaacs, who was married to his niece, Anne Elizabeth Fawcett. Tucker and Anne Elizabeth had gone uh, briefly to Ohio, but we're back in Charlottesville at that point because Tucker's mother, Nancy West, was still living here. In 1849, Eston Hemmings sold the remainder of the lot back to Nancy West, uh, relinquishing perhaps his only remaining tie to the city. In 1850, Nancy West sold her portion to her son, and then the same year, he sold the whole thing to the firm Hood and Laban. Uh, it's in that same year, 1850, that Nancy West, Tucker Isaacs, and Anne Elizabeth Isaacs all finally leave Charlottesville and move to Chilli Chillicothe as well. Now, one thing Nancy West consistently did was pass property back and forth among family members, uh, possibly in an attempt to grow a generational wealth that wouldn't have been afforded to them otherwise. Eventually, when she died in 1856, she left an extensive will denoting certain parts of her estate to certain of her children and grandchildren, it included money, it included uh, property and land. It also included things like railroad stocks and bonds. There were a lot of parts of that property that Nancy West willed. Now, oh, the second child, uh, second youngest child of David Isaacs and Nancy West was a daughter that they named Julia Ann. Julia Ann Isaacs was born in 1814 in Charlottesville. And in 1832, she married Eston Hemmings. On the left here uh, is the marriage license that sits in the courthouse. I got to go see it. I searched through a lot of books to find it. Um, now, Hemmings had been freed in his father's will when he turned 21 years old, uh, which would have been in 1829, but it does seem like he was living free possibly a little earlier than that. Now, Jefferson, in his will, had requested special permission for the five men he freed to allow them to stay in the state of Virginia uh, and, not be, or, and be exempt from Virginia's removal law in 1806. Now, sometime in the few years following the death of Eston's mother, Sally Hemings, in 1835, this section of the Hemings family moved to Chillicothe, Ohio, with two small children in tow, named John Wales and Anna. Other members of Monticello's enslaved community, who were living in freedom, uh, went to Chillicothe as well, including Eston's brother, Madison Hemings, and members of the Fawcett family. After living in Chillicothe for over 10 years, Eston and Julia Ann Hemings moved with their three children, to Madison, Wisconsin, where they changed their last name to Jefferson and assumed white identities. Essen Hemmings came from three generations of mixed race parentage, and Julia Ann Isaacs Hemmings came from two generations of the same. I've continued to ask myself throughout this project, what does any of this tell me about Jewish people in this time? We know that Julia Ann Isaacs would not have been accepted by the Jewish community as Jewish because her mother was not Jewish. Um, but 
her father belonged to a synagogue in Richmond. Now, we also have no records that indicate that any of David Isaac's children were raised in the Jewish faith or felt strongly about their Jewish identities. When David Isaacs died, the first part of his will stated that he wanted to be buried in the Richmond Hebrew Cemetery on Shaco Hill. Uh, I find this personally to be a curious choice. The reason for that uh, being that he would have known that being buried in a Jewish cemetery would have meant that he could not be buried next to his wife or any of his children who were not considered Jewish and would not have been allowed to be buried in that cemetery. It was his son, Tucker, and his son-in-law, Esten, who accompanied his body to Richmond. This means that Esten Hemings would have witnessed a Jewish burial ceremony. He would have heard Hebrew prayers. He would have probably seen a Jewish worship ceremony at the same time. Now, all of this being said, it was noted in a number of sources, including her obituaries, that Julia Ann Isaacs Hemings Jefferson, all of the names, uh, was involved in the Congregational Church in Madison, Wisconsin. Now, while her father was a German Jewish immigrant, she was clearly practicing Christian religious traditions later on in her life. Now, our other direct uh, Monticello connection in this family is through one of David Isaacs and Nancy West's sons, Tucker, who I've mentioned. Uh, Tucker Isaacs will marry Ann Elizabeth Fawcett, uh, though their marriage isn't recorded officially uh, until 1848. Uh, but they were living married earlier than that and had their first child in 1832. Now, at that time, Ann Elizabeth Fawcett was still technically living enslaved, and thus her children with Tucker Isaacs would have been living enslaved as well. At the dispersal sale at Monticello in 1827, Ann Elizabeth Fawcett was sold for $450 to John Wynne, who most likely bought her at the request of her father, Joseph Fawcett, um, because not long after that, Wynne will sell Ann Elizabeth back to her father, uh, and uh, he was buying back members of his family. Now, because of the removal law in 1806, Joseph Fawcett had to hold these members of his family technically still in bondage, uh, knowing that if he freed them without special permission from the legislature, they would be forced to leave the state. But on September 15, 1837, Joseph Fawcett went to the courthouse. He manumitted his wife, Edith Hearn Fawcett, his sons, William, Daniel, and Jesse, his daughters, Ann Elizabeth and Lucy, and four of Ann Elizabeth and Tucker Isaac's children, James, Joseph, Thomas, and Maria Elizabeth. Originally, the Isaacs moved with the Fawcett's to Ohio, but then they came back to Charlottesville because Tucker's mother, Nancy, was still living here. They remained here until 1850, when they finally moved back, bringing with them Nancy West and going to Ohio. The Isaacs' home, which is, was in Springfield Township outside of Chillicothe, Ohio, was a noted site on the Underground Railroad. The light that hung from their porch was said to be a beacon to refugee slaves who were hoping to escape the cruelties of slavery in the South. Uh, these are sketches of what the Isaacs home once looked like. I don't believe that it still stands there. Now, similarly to his sister, Julia Ann, it's unlikely that Tucker Isaacs ever had any major connections to his Jewish heritage. He accompanied his father's body to burial in Richmond, along with his brother-in-law, Eston Hemings, but there is no evidence to say that he felt any connection to Judaism. Instead, clearly, Tucker Isaacs and his wife both felt deeply connected to the free black communities that they were living in and to helping those who were formerly enslaved or who were trying to seek their freedom. Now, as I considered the Isaacs and West families, I started to look at what David Isaacs' Jewish contemporaries were doing and how that could inform me about the cho his choice to live in a common law marriage with a free black woman. Now, clearly, as I've shown already, some of his contemporaries, like Isaac Raphael or Nathaniel Wolfe, were enslaving a few domestic laborers. Uh, but David Isaac's closest contemporary was his brother, Isaiah. Now, Isaiah Isaacs uh, actually became one of the more interesting parts of my research. He was born in Germany like his brother. He immigrated to British North America and was recorded in Richmond as early as 1769. He helped to found the synagogue in Richmond, and he donated the land that became the cemetery where his brother would later be buried. Isaiah came to Charlottesville one year before David Isaacs in 1792, um, and it's unclear what Isaiah Isaacs' occupation was here, but in Richmond, he and Jacob Cohen had run a real estate and merchandise company, so it's similar, or it's likely that he was doing something similar. 
Now, when I first questioned what made David Isaacs different, rather than enslaving people like his other Jewish contemporaries, he married a free woman of color and had children who were of mixed racial background. I wondered if that had anything to do with his coming from Germany. Then I found that his brother, also born in Germany, mimicked more so what the others around him were doing, because Isaiah Isaacs enslaved at least five people here in Virginia. The records indicated that uh, he enslaved a woman named Lucy, who was actually freed during his lifetime in 1799. Her manumission was recorded in Richmond, uh, so it's possible that either he may have been still living there in some partial capacity, or maybe still owned property in the city and that she was living there as well. Uh, but it's unclear kind of from the records why Lucy's uh, manumission is in Richmond and not Charlottesville. But in 1803, Isaiah Isaacs filed his will in Albemarle County, and it indicated four other people who were manumitted in that document, uh, albeit with restrictions. Now, this shows that Isaiah Isaacs enslaved at least two other women and two men, Rachel, Polly, Henry, and James. Uh, some who have done research over time on Jews in Charlottesville, Jews in Virginia, or even as a whole in this time frame, have actually pointed to Isaiah Isaacs as someone who perhaps realized the wrongs of slavery. His will states, quote, being of opinion that all men are by, na by nature equally free and being possessed of some of those beings who are unfortunate, doomed to slavery as to them, I must enjoin upon my executor a strict observance of the following clause of my will. Uh, this is when he then frees four people and highlighted their names kind of in bold there, try to make it a little easier for you to see. Uh, Rachel, James, Polly and Henry in that order. Now, while on the surface, they may, this may be seen as a realization uh, on Isaiah Isaac's part that slavery was wrong or enslavement was wrong, he was not freeing these people immediately. Uh, I don't know the birth dates of the people that he enslaved, uh, but he is freeing them all at years in the future. Now, later, he said that the children of his female slaves would be freed at the age of 31. So it's possible that maybe he's using that age as a way to calculate these years in the future, though I'm really not sure. I, I don't know any of this for sure, but it does seem to me that he's doing so in part because he believes that enslaved people should be free, but he is also continuing their enslavement and the possible enslavement of their children. Now, taking the example of others who freed enslaved people in their wills, Thomas Jefferson included, it doesn't always absolve them of the wrongs of slavery in the first place. Now, a later codicil to Isaiah Isaac's will posted in January of 1806 indicated two or three children born to Rachel in the intervening years, a daughter named Mary, uh, and either two sons named Clement and Washington or one son named Clement Washington. Couldn't tell. Uh, and various sources kind of say various things. Now, this is where it came to a few uh, roadblocks and mysteries that I tried to solve, one of which I think I may have been successful. Now, the four people that Isaiah Isaacs freed were Rachel, Polly, Henry, and James. But I found in later records, uh, both Rachel and Polly listed in the federal censuses with the last name Isaacs. Uh, I couldn't, however, find anyone named Henry Isaacs, James Isaacs. When looking through manumission deeds and registrations of free black people later on, I found two men, one named John Garner and one named Nicholas Wynne, who in their manumission papers said that they were freed per the last will and testament of Isaiah Isaacs. But I read and transcribed the last will and testament of Isaiah Isaacs and found no one named John Garner or Nicholas Wynne. So I didn't know who they were. Maybe they were Henry and James. Maybe they were completely different people that I didn't know about. Uh, they were all filed in Albemarle County, so they couldn't have been uh, necessarily at other properties as well. Maybe, perhaps. I spent time at the courthouse. I rifled through deed books, wills, and other documents. I still wasn't quite sure who these two, two men were. Uh, and that's when I found something. I had a typed copy of references to the free black people in uh, uh, Albemarle County, um, when they were made to register in 1833, there were a lot of records that were coming out of this. Um, and the one reference had the name Henry, and in the typed reference, it had a strike through. And next to it, it said John T. Garner. Now, I think that this could possibly indicate that Henry, who was previously owned by Isaiah Isaacs, changed his name in freedom to John Garner. Uh, I don't know if that is true. I think that maybe it is. Uh, it could be corroborated then by his manumission papers that said that he was free per that will and testament. Uh, while historical mysteries are very interesting to track down, I had to reel myself in uh, because otherwise I was going to go down a bunch of rabbit holes and run out of time uh, to do this research. So 
Uh, I do think that this is something very interesting that could be looked into more in the future, but I ended up having to tell myself, get back to what you're supposed to be doing, Olivia, and stop doing this part, uh, but maybe come back to it at a later time. Now, Rachel Isaacs did interest me because she was one of the people in Isaiah Isaacs' will that I could continue to find reference to uh, here. She was listed in that 1833 Albemarle County Free Negro Register, which required all free black people in the county to register where they lived. Uh, as well as in the federal censuses from 1820 through 1860. She lived to be at least 77 years old. She was recorded as a washwoman in the 1860 census. Now, to me, I learned a lot of different things just from looking at Rachel Isaacs. Uh, I learned a little bit about the story of a woman who was enslaved in Charlottesville uh, and was able to gain her freedom in some capacity. It also told me a little bit about a Jewish man from Germany who enslaved and freed the people that he owned. It showed me, too, though, that we need always additional information to fully track down what we are talking about. Uh, I don't know everything about Rachel Isaacs, but being able to track her through these records informed me that looking at a record for someone named Rachel Isaacs was actually looking at the record of someone who was formerly enslaved and was a free woman of color. Because if I took a document and I just saw the name Rachel Isaacs, I would think that that was a Jewish woman but I learned a lot just from searching this. Now, it's at this point, I do want to sh shift gears a little bit, talk a little about the other family that I uh, did uh, most of my research on. Uh, clearly, a family tied significantly to Monticello is the Levy family. Now, for the purposes of uh, my research, I focused mostly on uh, Uriah Levy, a little bit on his brother, Jonas Phillips Levy, but because I was looking into the period of enslavement at uh, Monticello and on this property I kind of stopped there uh, because Uriah Levy dies uh, just before uh, kind of or during the Civil War so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that now the stewardship of uh, the home done by the Levies helped to save it uh, but Judaism did pose a serious obstacle to their ownership at times multiple members of the Levy family were subject to anti-semitic attacks on their Americanness their ability to care for a site of American history having been called, quote-unquote, foreigners, aliens, just because they were Jewish. Uh, today, like I said, I'll focus mostly on Uriah Levy and a little bit about the stories uh, of the people that he enslaved here. Now, Uriah Levy, on his mother's side, was fifth-generation American. Uh, the Mikado line had been in the United States since Samuel Nunez came with 40 other Jews to help found the colony of Georgia in 1733. Rebecca Mikado married Jonas Phillips, their portraits are the ones that you see on the right here. That's Uriah Levy's grandparents. Uh, and they had, wait for it, 21 children. Okay, uh, so this family's huge. And the family trees are on like four different sheets of paper when I tried to print it out. <laughs> now, the Levy side of Uriah Levy's family is a little less known. His father, Michael Levy, uh, was of German and Ashkenazic descent, uh, whereas the Philip side of the family was Portuguese and Sephardic descent. Now, though Uriah Levy was born in Philadelphia, his family belonged to the first synagogue established in New York, which was called Shearth Israel. Uriah Levy's parents, uh, Rachel Phillips, whose image is here, Michael Levy, who there is no image of, they were married in Philadelphia in 1787. Now, interestingly enough, I found an unexpected loose tie to Monticello because attending the wedding of Uriah Levy's parents was none other than signer of the Declaration of Independence, Dr. Benjamin Rush. Now, uh, he wrote about the ceremony in a letter to his wife, and some believe that this is probably the first description of a Jewish wedding in North America. Uh, he wrote about hearing the Hebrew language and that he could only understand, quote, an amen or hallelujah. Uh, and he noticed other parts of the ceremony that have been in Jewish weddings for hundreds of years. He commented on people covering their heads, that the couple stood under a canopy, which is known as a chuppah. Uh, and he even wrote about the ceremonial breaking of the glass. But he also told his wife that after the ceremony, he went up to the guests of the wedding and asked them about these customs because he wanted to understand them a little bit better. Now, Rachel Phillips uh, was said to really love Monticello. Her son Uriah purchased the property in 1834, and starting in 1836, she took up residence here. Uh, she died at Monticello in 1839, uh, and her grave is still located on Mulberry Row in the site of an old stone house. Now, oftentimes when we talk about the Levies, we do talk mostly about Uriah Levy's admiration for Thomas Jefferson. 
how Jefferson's authorship of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom allowed the levies to practice their Judaism freely in the United States. Not often talked about, however, or mentioned at all, is the fact that Uriah Levy, during his ownership of Monticello, enslaved approximately 21 people here. Now, I wanted to look more into this, really bringing it back to my research question from the beginning, how did a Jewish man from New York, uh, Uriah Levy, come to enslave people at Monticello when a Jewish man from Virginia, David Isaacs, uh, married into the free black community in Charlottesville. If we tried to answer this question, maybe b based on our assumptions, we might assume that the man from New York was the anti-slavery one. The man from Virginia would have been pro-slavery. Uh, though I wouldn't necessarily categorize Uriah Levy as pro-slavery, I would consider him uh, to be someone who was participating in and profiting from the institution of slavery itself. He didn't enslave people in New York because it was illegal there, but in Virginia, he could, so he did. Now, local historian Sam Towler has done a lot of research uh, to try to track down the people who were enslaved uh, here, not only by Uriah Levy, but also by some of his farm managers like Ira Garrison and uh, Joel Wheeler. Now, Levy may have had around 20 enslaved people here, but Wheeler also eventually probably had around 20 enslaved people as well. So there were many people who were still being enslaved on this property beyond the life of Thomas Jefferson. The main families were the Wests and the Careys, and I will say that so far I do not think those Wests are connected to Nancy West in any way. I've been trying to track down if there is any relation in those families. There were others uh, whose last names Towler hasn't been able to track, I wasn't able to track. Uh, an ongoing work, really, to find this information. I will say that Sam Towler gave a talk uh, at the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society that goes into a lot of the details of this research. It's available on their YouTube if you're interested in learning more about some of the families that were here, um, the Black and African-American families that were here during the levy period. Now, the re first recorded purchase of an enslaved person by Uriah Levy was a woman named Aggie Dickerson West. She was a cook, purchased in 1835, which was just one year after Levy purchased Monticello. Levy was listed on both the 1850 and 1860 federal census slave schedules, uh, which were showing what you see here, right, that he owned 14 people in 1850, 21 people by 1860. Now, in 1864, the Confederacy confiscated the property at Monticello, uh, and 19 enslaved people were also sold along with the house and the land here. There are references and other records, though, to the enslaved people at Monticello during Uriah Levy's period. Levy employed people like Garrison and later Wheeler, who may have been enslaving people here, overseeing the labor of enslaved people or some combination of the two. And Uriah Levy had a late in life marriage to his niece, Virginia Lopez, who ended up living until 1925. She gave accounts of her time at Monticello and told a number of stories actually that included some of the enslaved people. She mentioned a man or a child named Juba. Uh, we don't have any records of someone by that name, though I think it could have been a name that she was using. Uh, for possibly someone like John or Joshua West. Now, Jonas Phillips Levy, Uriah's brother, also left a later unpublished autobiography and spoke about his visit to Monticello in 1835. He said that his brother Uriah was, quote, superintending his slaves and other workmen. Now, these references persist, noting that people were enslaved here, but much like other records left by white people at this time, they mention those that they enslaved, but they don't tell us their names and they don't really tell us anything about the enslaved people or their families. Now, another question I found myself asking uh, went back actually to Uriah Levy's history in the Navy. Uh, while perhaps not immediately relevant to his ownership of Monticello, Uriah Levy spent much of his career in the United States Navy and is known as one of the strongest proponents against the use of flogging as punishment for sailors. He was so much against the practice that on a ship he captained called the USS Macedonian, he outlawed the practice and tried other punishments instead, uh, like making sailors wear signs that said their crime, so they would have to walk around the deck with a sign that said uh, drunkenness or thievery, and it was meant to humiliate them for their crime uh, instead of the use of flogging. But taking all of this, how then can we consider how enslaved people were treated at Monticello under the ownership of Uriah Levy, under the ownership of a man who thought it so wrong to use the whip on naval sailors? Now, Uriah Levy published an essay on the use of flogging in the Navy. I will spare you, that essay was 139 pages long. But I'll read you a quick selection of what he says, because he writes, quote, The question may therefore soon become not whether the power to inflict corporal punishment shall be taken from the commanders of our ships of war, but what disciplinary means shall be substituted for that authority. And he continued, he said, All admit that such commanders, 
Acting singly should be on their people deck superior to everyone and everything, except the laws of God and of their country. Can such a supremacy be maintained without the means of checking the lazy and the skulking, the vicious and the unruly by a system of terror? Unfortunately, I do not have a way to answer the question that I asked. Uh, there don't seem to be any records discussing Uriah Levy's treatment of the enslaved people here, nor the treatment under managers like Garrison and Wheeler. But when we look at the way that other people spoke about the enslaved people here, it's likely that they were being treated the same way that other enslaved people in the South were. So I've decided to focus primarily just on one of the people who was enslaved by Levy here, a woman uh, and cook named Aggie Dickerson West. It's believed that she married John West and that they had five children who were all presumably owned by Levy as well. Two sons named Fleming and Joshua and three daughters named Daisy, Augusta, and Martha. Her full name may also have been Augusta and shortened to Aggie. Um, she's always referred to by Aggie, though. And she was bought by Levy from the Minor family of Carsbrook in 1835, and she lived until 1858. Ira Garrison wrote a letter to Uriah Levy informing him of Aggie's death. Levy subsequently wrote a letter to his lawyer, George Carr, that Garrison, quote, afflicts me with the announcement of the death of my faithful servant, Aggie. I shall miss her very much, for she was much attached to me as I was to her. And naturally, she was attached to him by the fact that she was enslaved by him. But it shows his views, right, about Aggie as well. Now, Levy's wife, Virginia, spoke about her in her recollections, saying she was an excellent cook but that she was unhappy when she was taken north and separated from her family. Now, this doesn't tell us anything about how Aggie Dickerson West felt about her enslavers. Doesn't, but it does tell us a little bit about how they viewed her. They favored her for her cooking skills and felt her close to them, or as Uriah Levy said, faithful. She wanted to be among her family, though, and made it known when she was separated from them that she was unhappy with it. Virginia Lopez Levy's account shares a few stories uh, I will warn that they use antiquated and racist language. She referred to the enslaved people as quote-unquote darkies and talks about the things that they did and how she interacted with them. In telling her stories and in the publishing of the accounts, uh, either Lopez Levy or the writer used a dialect when writing what enslaved people said. In these stories, she spoke of an unnamed enslaved child who she said she quote, made somewhat of a pet of. And then she also spoke about enslaved people like Juba and Aggie. The words of Virginia Lopez Levy indicated to me that she was speaking of enslaved people in the same ways that others in the white non-Jewish communities often did as well. She used racist language to describe them, and she told stories that were designed to make them look funny or daft and to show how she thought they were quote-unquote amusing, a word that she used. Now, Uriah Levy died on March 22, 1862 in New York. The Civil War had already broken out, and Virginia had already seceded from the United States, joining the Confederate States of America. In his will, Levy left the home at Monticello to the people of the United States, uh, which caused significant strife for the family members and for many years afterward. He also left to his nephew, uh, whose name is written as Ashel, but I think it was Asahel, uh, the land that he bought up near Monticello called Washington Farm and, quote, all my Negro slaves. They listed them in the same sentence as the rest of his farm property, like horses, cattle, stocks, and crops. Now, this bequest to Asaho Levy never occurred because the property was instead confiscated in 1864 as property belonging to the supporters of the United States rather than the Confederate States. Though Levy had already died, his will was not honored because of his ties to New York and the quote-unquote North. Now, on November 17, 1864, the Confederate government confiscated Monticello and held a sale of the property. While the actual records are no longer extant because they burned in Richmond, there are, there are articles, like the one that you see up here, uh, that help us find out what happened. A few enslaved people are named in this article from the New York Times. A man named Fook, who sold for $7,000. Uh, a man named Fleming, who's likely Fleming West, the son of Adney Dickerson and John West, who sold for $7,450. A man named Lewis, who sold for $73.50. A man named John, who's probably John West, Aggie's husband, Fleming's father, who sold to Uriah Levy's brother, Jonas Levy, for $5,400. A woman and her seven children, Sam Towler thinks that this might be a woman named Ann Carey. They all sold to Benjamin Franklin Ficklin, who was the man who also then purchased the Monticello house. 
There were five total other young girls and a man and his wife who were put up and then withdrawn, bringing the total number of people to 19. The thing that really struck me about this, though, was that John, presumably John West, was purchased by Uriah Levy's brother. Jonas Phillips Levy, a captain in the American Merchant Marine, spent his life on the water like his brother. He has a fascinating story. I do not have time for it, uh, but ended with him getting honorary citizenship to Peru uh, and coming back to Washington, D.C. to petition for monetary compensation for laws, losses during uh, the Mexican-American War. Now, while living in Washington, he was involved in the Jewish community there and even helped to found the Washington Hebrew Congregation in the city. He also, in spending time petitioning for that compensation, met prominent representatives like Jefferson Davis and Judah Philip Benjamin, the first Jewish senator in the United States and the later Secretary of War for the Confederacy. Jonas Levy befriended these two men and later wrote many letters to them during the Civil War. In 1861, while his brother Uriah was in New York and only a year from death, Jonas Levy was residing at Monticello. He got into disputes with Monticello's farm manager, Joel Wheeler. Jonas Levy, a Southern apologist and supporter of the Confederacy, erected a Confederate flag at Monticello during the time that he was living here. Wheeler, who did not share the same sympathies, took that flag down. Wheeler and Levy got into a disagreement over this. Uh, and eventually, Jonas Levy wrote to Judah Benjamin asking him to send someone from the Confederate government to Monticello to arrest Joel Wheeler. Now, as far as I know, that never happened. But after the death of his brother, Jonas Levy tried to prove his right to ownership of Monticello. In an 1862 letter to Senator B. Hill, Levy wrote, quote, I am a loyal citizen of this Confederacy and have donated all my energies to the success of its cause. He, at that time, was a full-time resident of Wilmington, North Carolina, where he operated a store that supplied goods to the Confederate Army, but he also thought that Monticello should be rightfully his. Clearly, this petition was not considered because the house was up for sale to anyone who would purchase it by 1864, and Levy was not the person who does. He did, however, at that sale, buy an enslaved man named John, who had been previously owned by his brother. Ultimately, People like Uriah and Jonas Levy continue to prove what historians have argued. Jewish people owned and treated enslaved people in the same way that their non-Jewish counterparts did. Now, I argue that it wasn't because of their Judaism that they owned slaves, but despite their Judaism. They participated in their communities, Jewish communities, Southern communities, white communities, as individuals, and they made their decisions based on that. Members of the Levy family held pro-slavery sentiments or pro-Southern sentiments, like Jonas Levy, same as members of the family offered to fight for Abraham Lincoln, like Uriah Levy. The Jewish stories that we can tell at Monticello enrich the history that we already tell here. They show the complicated ways that race and religion operate together. They show that people made decisions that favored one identity over another. And they show that Jefferson's overall vision for a religiously free country allowed his contemporaries and later generations of Jewish people to continue being tied to his home and plantation. I think if we could want to continue to broaden our understanding of Monticello's history, we can look at it through the lens of Jewish people like David Isaacs and Uriah Levy. But it's the way that we tell these stories that is important. As a guide, I've been asked time and again questions like, how did Uriah Levy make his money? And, wow, he bought it for a lot less than he sold it for later. Where'd that profit go? Now, the way we think about Jews is often steeped in thousands of years of history which means it's also steeped in thousands of years of anti-Semitism. Now, there are nuances to the stories of Jewish people at Monticello, and the language that we can use to discuss the history lends itself to an understanding not only of their faith as Jewish people, but also the place that they hold in their society, held in their societies and the way that they were treated by their contemporaries. In 2017, three months before neo-Nazis marched swastikas down Charlottesville's Main Street, members of Shearth Israel Congregation in New York came to honor the anniversary of Rachel Levy's death. Rabbi Dr. Meyer Solovichik said, quote, we seek to do good because we are inspired by the lives that have come before us. May they live on in the heart and memory of American Jews for generations to come. I say, may they also live on in the stories that we tell here at Monticello. Thank you all very much for listening.